this is really fantastic. I have never spoken to this many people before, and I've got this giant stage. And I was raised by um, war children who taught me to never waste things, so I feel like I have to go all the way over here and all the way over there, because otherwise I've wasted all this space. And I kind of feel like maybe I should have brought my nine-year-old son with me, who's really good at gymnastics, because he could have just like done a routine behind me while I was talking. But then that might have been a bit distracting, so maybe not. OK, so um, I am a technical lead with ThoughtWorks. Uh, we are a consultancy, a software development consultancy. And that means that one of the things that I do in my job is that I introduce new practices to all types of developer. And when I say new practices, I probably am mostly talking about XP, so extreme programming practices, particularly things like pair programming and test-driven development. But I'm also talking about introducing um, new knowledge, so new tools, new technologies, new languages, new ways of doing things. And I'm not, you know, I mean, it's different every time. So I'm not being very specific about what skills I might be teaching. Um, oh, there's a thing, isn't there? Right, sorry. Uh, next slide. OK. Um, so um, I want to start by saying that I'm not perfect. Whoops. Because I think there's a real tendency, particularly if you get up on a stage like this and talk to this many people, to think that you're supposed to be an expert and that part of your job is to convince people why they should bother listening to you. And I think there's a tendency in this position to think that, therefore, I have to give you the impression that I'm perfect and that all of the things that I'm going to tell you about, I do all of those things and I do them all perfectly and I never make any mistakes. And that's totally not true. And I think it's really important that I tell you that that's not true because I am a teacher. And as a teacher, it's part of my job to help pupils who are fellow developers believe that they can succeed. Now, if I'm giving them an example and saying, here's me, I'm perfect, you should be like me, I'm giving them something unrealistic. I'm giving them a goal that they're not going to be able to achieve. So at some point, that's going to lead to a dissonance that's going to cause them to lose heart. And that's not what I want. So I don't want you to think that I'm perfect, because I'm not. So when I talk about a lot of the techniques that I'm going to talk about today, these are things that I aspire to. These are things that I try to do. But I'm reminding myself, as well as you, about what good practice looks like. Because I can be lazy, and I can be impatient, and I can be forgetful. And I'm human, and you should be too. But we are all teachers. Now, I'm assuming that a lot of people in this room are either lead developers or aspiring lead developers. But even if you're not, you're still a teacher. We should all be teachers. And we are all teachers because we are all teaching each other all the time. And I think as a lead developer, you have to embrace that. Now, that might actually be a bit scary, but it's OK. And it's really important. And you're actually doing it whether you know it or not. So you should embrace it. You should be aware of it. And you should examine your practice as a teacher. Now, I'm going to start the talk with a kind of a series of principles. Uh, and one of them is no elitism. And I have another talk that I also do, which is called um, Let's Stop Making Each Other Pe Feel Stupid, which I'm really, really into at the moment. So if you want me to do that talk too somewhere, ask me, because it's my new exciting talk. But I'm not talking about that today. But I am going to mention this idea of what I call intellectual elitism. And I think it's a big problem in this industry. I think it's a big problem in any industry that relies on knowledge that has this idea that the experienced practitioners are supposed to be clever. Now, the problem with that is that as you progress within those industries, you feel like you are supposed to be clever. And that means that you feel like you're supposed to prove to everybody else how clever you are, and you're supposed to judge everybody else if you don't think they're clever enough. And what it leads to is this kind of elite at the top, who talk jargon to each other. Nobody understands them, and they probably don't understand each other. But they think they're special, and they want you to think they're special. And that's not right. That is not how we should be working with each other. That is not how to build effective teams. 
uh, and somebody um, gave me this great quote, everybody is just as stupid as I am. Um, so empathy is something that I talk about a lot. And in the original version of this talk, I just had every 10 slides, there was one that said empathy. Uh, and I just kept saying, empathy, it's really important. But then I realized when I actually watched a video of myself doing the talk, and I realized that that's all I ever said, and I never explained what I meant. Um, and if you're teaching somebody, then what you want to do is feel empathy for them. And what do I mean? I mean, imagine what it feels like to be them. Imagine what it felt like when you were in a similar position. Turn it around. When you watch people's reactions, when you watch people's practice, when you're surprised or concerned by things that people are doing, think about why. Because it really, really helps to try and put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Another thing I want to talk about is diversity. And I mean diversity of gender, diversity of race, diversity of um, neuro, I can't think what the noun is, um, you know, ways of thinking, ways of being, where you're from, as much diversity as possible. This is what we want in our teams. This is what we should want in our teams um, because people, teams perform better when there's diversity, but also because you want to encourage people. We need more people in this industry. And if we restrict it to just one very small part of the population, and we're missing out. So, okay, we want diversity. What's that got to do with this talk? I think that a lot of the techniques that I'm going to talk about will really help with diversity. I think a lot of them are about seeing people as people, thinking about what people's needs are, and finding ways of getting everybody involved and giving everybody a chance to contribute and to learn. And that helps with um, diversity. Teaching is something that should always be inclusive. So now I'm going to give you a few strategies for how you can teach skills to members of your team. The first one is pairing. Now, I, I put that picture there because it's brilliant, but it's not actually what I think pairing should look like, because they look like they don't really want to be sitting on that chair with each other. <laughs> And, uh, and ideally, that's not what pairing is like, but it can be. And you have to be aware of it. You have to pay attention to members of your team who are pairing with each other. And, you know, are they getting along? Is it a difficult experience? Is there anything you can do to help? But the reason I'm calling pairing out here is because I think it is a fantastic way of teaching and learning. And it made a massive difference to my career. So I, I left IT for a while. I did something completely different for four years. After having been a software engineer for 12 years, I got in, I'd had enough, fed up with the whole thing, left the industry, didn't think I was coming back, um, but then you know, tried to be a teacher. So to, to be fair, I kind of sell myself as an ex-high school math teacher, and that is true. I did retrain as a high school math teacher, and it all went horribly wrong, and I ended up with no job. So <laughs> I came back into IT. Um, and um, one of the things that I learned when I came back into the industry, which is about six years ago, was pairing. Now, I'd heard of pairing before that, and I thought it was a ridiculous idea. I thought it sounded like hell on earth. I thought, why would you want to spend your whole day with one other person? Why would you want to let go of your keyboard and your code and have somebody else's fingers in there? That would just be horrible. Um, and I actually was very quickly won round. And, and one of the things, when I came back into the industry, I was quite insecure. I didn't, my skills were out of date. I deliberately came back in at entry level, didn't feel like I really knew anything useful. Uh, and by pairing with other people, not only did I learn much more quickly, because it's all very well if you ask somebody to teach you what they know in a classroom setting, but they'll miss bits out. And there will be things that they know that they've forgotten that they know. But when you not only sit next to them, but work with them, when everything they do on their keyboard and you see on their screen, you are aware of, every little funny little shortcut, you can go, well, hang on a minute, how did you make that happen? So all of those little things that they wouldn't think of to tell you if you asked them, you can observe, witness, and you firsthand, you can, oh, that's useful. That's interesting. What are you doing now? How did you do that? 
And that is a fantastic way of learning, and it's a fantastic way of teaching, because it, you know we're not all trained teachers, and it's not that easy to teach. Um, but by sitting with somebody and being patient and being prepared to explain what you're doing and talk, you talk them through what you're doing, you are automatically teaching them. You're also, and this I am absolutely eternally grateful to all of the people in my career that have said to me, I'm confused because I'm confused a lot of the time, you know, and, you know, something that I would say to you all is just because you're in a leadership position does not mean you should hide when you are confused. It actually makes it more important that you tell people when you're confused. You be completely open and honest about that. And there are ways of doing it. So it's one of the things that I often say to people is asking questions is not only fine, it's important. Asking simple questions is not only fine, it's important. But the way that you do it makes all the difference. So if you go, oh, I'm really sorry, but I'm a bit confused and I don't understand that, and I'm really stupid, sorry, then people will judge you. They will. They shouldn't, but they will. But if you say, right, OK, I get that bit, and I get that bit, but this bit here, no, you've completely lost me, really confused, explain it to me. Now, I did that in a very confident way, in a way where I assumed that you would respect me for asking you a question. And because I've done it with that attitude, then you are more likely to help me and more likely to not judge me. And if you do judge me, then you can sod off. Um, <laughs> but... When you're pairing and your pair says, I'm really confused, when you're pairing and your pair says, I'm going to Google this because I've no idea what it is, that's really liberating for you as a pupil. And you're, when you're pairing and this person who you've looked up to and think is way more experienced than you doesn't know something that you know, that's really empowering. And that's, that really helps you in your learning journey. So pairing, for the win, fantastic. Um, workshops. So I have run a lot of workshops, particularly on a project that I was on last year where I was doing a lot of enablement work. I was the technical lead for a team of developers, none of whom were ThoughtWorks developers. They were client developers. And it was a very large part of my job to help to upskill them and to help them to learn new things. So I ran a lot of workshops and I would do them at the drop of a hat. And OK, so I accept that I've done that before. It is easier for me because I've done it before. But it will get easier for you if you keep doing it. And the thing about workshops is don't feel like you have to... Um, don't feel like what you're supposed to be delivering is a professional workshop that people would pay thousands of pounds for. This can be just something that's knocked together. It can be like, OK, we've worked out that everybody in this team is a bit confused about this one thing. So uh, on our team, one of the many things we ran a workshop on was async await in um, C Sharp. We were a bit confused about it. I was a bit confused about it. So um, I said, right, OK, let's do a workshop. And in that case, what I did was, I mean, I actually had learned about async await in the past, and it was sort of the knowledge was buried in there somewhere. Um, so I brushed up on it. I spent, you know, an hour or so kind of looking it up, reminding myself, uh, working out what I thought were the most useful things we could learn, uh, and thinking about what might be an example in our current code base that we could have a go at that would help us to work it out. And then... Together, so I did a bit of an intro. I told them what I knew, which wasn't very much. Uh, I devised an example that was based on our actual code base, so it took less work. Uh, I split them into pairs, and I said, look, so I'll have a go at it. Give them half an hour, come back together, discuss where you've got up to. What, you, what did you get stuck on? What do we need to know more about? Then split off again, then come back again. That's a really handy um, framework for a workshop. And the more time you have to prepare and think about what the questions might be and maybe come up with some kind of scaffolding, create an example, the better. But don't, it's something you can iterate on. It could be a complete shambles. It doesn't matter. If you... If your team have a culture where you are all learning together and you aren't saying to them, I'm the expert and you're all learners, then that means you can all kind of just muck in and go, look, let's have a go at this. OK, what went wrong? Do a retro at the end. Was it helpful? Was it not helpful? Was it a complete disaster? OK, what do we need to do to make sure that if we do it again, we do it better? Don't be afraid. But by getting everybody together in a room and exploring something, there are so many different benefits. 
And I'm calling out group learning as a separate thing from a workshop. So I would see a workshop as something a little bit more structured, where I would do as much preparation as I had time for. Oh, and the other thing is I'll just Google. I'll find somebody else's workshop. You know, it doesn't have to be my workshop. Um, but then group learning is where we all go into the room and none of us know anything about the thing that we want to learn. I'm not pretending that I do. I'm saying I'm in the same position as you, but let's learn it together. So in that case, typically, I'll Google, I'll look for a tutorial, I'll have a quick look at it to make sure it's not completely bonkers, um, uh, and then we will just work through it together. So again, you can, depending on the size of your team, you can do it as a mob. So if you've got five or six people, you can, you can have one screen, one laptop, one keyboard that you take it in turns, you can have a timer, um, or you can split off into pairs uh, or smaller groups, depending on how many of you are, depending on your setup. If you don't have a big screen, don't try mobbing, because six people around one laptop is literally painful. Um, so, you know, look at what you've got, tailor it to, to your circumstances, and then do a retro. Then do just, just a quick post-it exercise at the end. What went well? What didn't went go well? How would you like to do it differently next time? Um, but be wary <laughs> of overloading your poor team. <laughs> and this is one of the reasons that I wasn't actually a very good maths teacher, um, because I was trying to teach maths to bored teenagers who hated maths. And I underestimated how much bored teenagers hate maths. Um, uh, and I also forgot that I had a maths degree, and they didn't. Uh, and, uh, and I would, and I like maths. I think maths is really exciting. So I'd get really excited. Go, oh, look, you can do this and this and this and this. And then I would be faced with 30 faces <laughs> like that. <laughs> so you have to, you have to pay attention to, you know, what people look like. Do they look like they are just really confused? And it's really important because actually you can make things worse for people. If you present information to them in a way, if you try to help them learn in a way that just makes them feel stupid, then not only will they not learn, but they will be put off from doing any further learning and they'll be more likely to be the next person that leaves your team. So, you know, again, empathy. Pay attention. If you're going too fast, slow down. It doesn't matter. It, there is absolutely no point in giving yourself a learning deadline. You know, we, by the end of today, we will have learned A, B, C, D, and E. Because if you are rigid and sticking to that, then by the end of the day, if A, B, C, D, and E is just too much, then they won't have learned anything, and it was pointless. You have to go at the pace of the people who are learning. And just a quick one about that, actually, because that's something that comes up, is if I'm going at the pace of the people who are learning, what happens if they're learning at different paces? Which obviously happens. You know, so what if this person's racing ahead, and this person's still confused? Well, I don't want this person to get bored, but I don't want this person to be put off. So get this person to teach this person. Because, and it's a standard classroom tactic that teachers use. Um, the best way to consolidate your learning, the best way to take your, take your learning to the next level is to explain it to somebody else. And it's no good having a complex understanding of something if you can't explain it to somebody else. Somebody was telling me a story yesterday about um, somebody who was um, doing a PhD. I can't remember the exact... It was something along the lines of they were asked to explain their PhD to a supervisor, and they couldn't. And their supervisor said, well, you don't understand it yet, then, do you? If you can't explain it to... And this was a supervisor who didn't know the subject very well. So if you can't explain it to... Oh, no, it's to the cleaner. That's the story. Sorry. It'd be better if I had a better memory. If you can't explain your PhD to the cleaner... And they were making assumptions there, because how do we know the cleaner isn't somebody who's come from another country with a PhD but couldn't get a job in this country and has had to get a job as a cleaner? But... You know, <laughs> if you can't explain your PhD to somebody who is completely new to the subject, then you don't understand your PhD. So actually, being able to explain your complex knowledge to somebody who doesn't get it yet is a way of consolidating that knowledge. That was a bit of a tangent, but that's fine. Oh, ha, OK, I kind of just done that one. <laughs> so, yeah. It, you should try to, t whenever you learn anything new, 
explain it to somebody else. Whenever your team learns anything new, get them to explain it to each other. Pair people up, get the people who know stuff to explain it to the people who don't know stuff, because they're not just helping you out, they are consolidating their own knowledge. So lunch and learns are really good. Now, when I say lunch and learn, some people call them brown bag sessions. What I mean is establish a regular cadence. If you can do it weekly, brilliant. If it's got to be fortnightly, monthly, whatever works for you. But try and have somebody do a talk or, or a workshop um, at regular intervals in a predictable time frame. Uh, and the things that they talk about do not have to be anything to do with work. They can be. There are so many different things, ways you can do this. So um, if you're in a large company that has silos, get people to do talks on subjects that are aimed at explaining what they do to the rest of the company. Get people to explain different domain areas to different areas of the company. Get people to tell you about the magic tricks they do at the weekend. Get people to tell you, teach you how to knit. Um, and the reason for that is because it helps to foster this culture of learning, that we should all be learning all the time. We should all be able to get excited about learning. We should be encouraging each other to get excited about learning because it's not possible to be in this industry and just hold on to the same knowledge forever. You are going to have to learn new things, and you are going to have to embrace that, and you want your teams to embrace that. You want them to not feel insecure about it. You want them to not feel like this is something they're supposed to do secretly in their own time. You want this to be something that is explicitly part of the culture and is celebrated. And by having regular sessions where you just tell each other stuff, you're building that culture, you're building that idea of getting exciting about learning new stuff. So I talked about asking questions, but I want to say it again, you know, I deliberately, okay, so actually, so I say this to people, I say I deliberately ask questions all the time and I do it because I'm so cool and I'm like, you know, I'm trying to prove to everybody around me because I'm mentoring all these people that it's okay to ask questions. Uh, and I tell people that's why I'm doing it. And that's why I keep doing it, but that's not actually why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I want to know what the answers are. <laughs> like, and most of the time, and I've got a terrible memory, which I've already proved, uh, and I, I forget stuff all the time, uh, and I, I like understanding stuff, and I get frustrated when I don't. And I don't like it when people use jargon that I don't understand, and I don't like it when people use terms that I once knew what they meant, but I can't remember. So I, I will ask questions all the time. I'm not, you know, when I was doing my teacher training, I was the least favorite people in the classroom. We actually, we actually had classroom sessions where we, be, we were being taught about teaching. Um, <laughs> everybody got really pissed off with me because I was always the one with my hand up. And everybody, Claire, it's time to go home. Yes, but I want to know something else. Um, but ask questions because you want to know the answers. Ask questions because you want your team to know the answers. Ask questions because you need your team to understand things if they are going to function. And you need them to be asking questions too. And you need them to know that no question is too stupid. So people have often said to me, you know, um, people in relatively junior positions have said to me, oh, you know what, I love it when you, you asked that question the other day because I really wanted to know the answer and I thought it was a really stupid question. Uh, there is, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, and I ask stupid questions all the time. Uh, and... And it removes that sheen of, oh, yes, I know exactly what's going on. Because nobody, nobody, well, OK, there might be some annoying people in the corner who know exactly what's going on. But most of us don't. And, you know, let's not pretend that we do. Um, right, OK, so uh, another technique that I have mentioned. This is at the start of a quote from a guy called Woody Zewell. And it goes, all the brilliant, I changed it to all the brilliant minds. He actually says, all the brilliant people working on the same thing at the same time, in the same space, and on the same computer. So mob programming is another one, you know, where I was like, OK, pair programming is brilliant, but mob programming, no, ridiculous. Um, because it does seem like it surely must be quite inefficient to have, you know, six people. I'd say six is probably a maximum. But, you know, to have six people all in the same room working on the same computer, same keyboard, same piece of code, that can't be efficient, can it? And amazingly, it can be, because you've got all the domain expertise in the room. You know, you've got all of the knowledge of the code base. You don't have to do it all the time. But I find it's particularly useful if you're starting a new feature. 
uh, or if you're doing a handover. Uh, what you want is a situation where everybody gets it. Everybody knows what direction you're moving in. Everybody understands the framework that you're using. Everybody's in agreement about what your aims are. You've got a QA in the room to point out all of the things that you hadn't thought of. You've got a business analyst in the room to point out all of the things you hadn't thought of, to tell you about, um, you've got a product owner in the room potentially, to actually provide a conduit to the business so that you're not waiting until you've delivered something and then finding out that you've done it wrong. Um, there are, it means that somebody who needs a cup of tea can just nip out. Somebody who needs to work from home can dial in. It's, um, it's really, and it's another way that's a really great way of knowledge sharing and of teaching. So, um, I've written down here, don't praise the knowledge, praise the thirst for knowledge. Um, and there's a, a lot of research around teaching that says that children who are just given unqualified blanket praise do not progress or even feel as secure as those who are given targeted praise that's meaningful and also given critical feedback on the things that they're not doing right. It actually feels better. Children are not stupid. I mean, I'm not talking about children, but people are not stupid. Children are not stupid. They know when you're just funneling them. They actually want you to tell them what they did well in a concrete, meaningful way. And they also need to know what they didn't do so well. Uh, and in a similar terms, if you're just praising people because they know stuff, then you're actually making the people who don't know the stuff feel worse. And that's not actually the point anyway. What you should be praising is the thirst for knowledge. What you want people to do is want to learn new stuff. So as Marit was saying about functional programming, you want people to want to learn new stuff. And so therefore, you have to give them time to learn new stuff. You have to give them opportunities to do deep dives. You have to let them go off and just explore and have a go at doing something that might be apparently irrelevant to your project, but it's going to stimulate their minds. It's going to encourage them to go off and find new ways of doing things. Um, and a lot of what I've talked about is hinting at this. But you want your teams to feel safe and secure. You want them to feel like they're in an environment where it's OK to ask questions, it's OK to admit ignorance, it's OK to be a bit crazy and weird. It's OK to be themselves. And this is like, you know, blatant plug for ThoughtWorks, but ThoughtWorks is the best place I've ever worked. It is my favorite job ever. I've been in the industry for 18 years. And one of the reasons is that it's explicitly part of the induction that you come to work as yourself. And, you know, I've got all sorts of crazy little weirdnesses that I used to feel like I had to hide from my colleagues. And now I, don't, I feel like I can just be myself. And that's part of safety and security. If you create an environment where your developers feel like they can be themselves, they can be honest about their needs, that they will be safe, they won't be judged or laughed at, then you will get much better results from them. Um, one of the things that I really noticed when I was working in Stockport last year, that was that particularly when we were think, doing things like TDD, or we were just generally talking about unit tests and about how to write a good unit test, um, and I would be thinking, oh, I'm not quite sure how to explain this. And then later on, at some completely different point, I'd be playing with somebody else, and I'd spot an example in the code, and I'd think, oh, this is a really good example of what I was talking about the other day. So I make a note of it. And then I make sure that I pair with that other person again. And when I do, I say, look, there's this thing I found that's a really good example of what I was talking about the other day. Highlight those good examples. And remember that nobody knows everything not even you. And that's OK, and that's something to be celebrated. Um, if you're having regular retros, then what you're, and you're, those retros are genuinely open, and that you are, everybody feels safe to criticize and to call out things that are not going well, as well as praise the things that are going well, then what you're doing is you're encouraging your team to own the work that they do. Because it's not yours, it's theirs. And if they have an input into how things are done and their voices are heard, then they will care more and they will do better work. So retrospectives in my book are a really good way of building that ownership. If, as long as they're open and everybody gets a chance to say something and they know that it's okay. 
Feedback is another way of doing that. So when you regularly um, build it into your, you know, your routines, that you regularly give each other feedback. So if you have one-to-ones, and it's a two-way street. It's not just you giving them feedback, it's them giving you feedback. Ask for feedback regularly. And also, remember, positive feedback is really, really important. Feedback does not equal criticism. Feedback is not just a way of you telling them all the things they're doing wrong. Feedback is a way for you to scaffold people and nurture them and tell them what they're doing right. Um, and on the same page, you, as leads, need to be open to change. Don't assume you know all the answers. Don't assume you know the right way to do something. Don't assume that your way of doing it is the right way of doing it. Allow the possibility that things can change. Now, this slide... I. The, these slides, were they are, they're all mine, and the, the, the content is pretty much as it originally was, but I'm fantastic. I was, give, I was offered a designer to help me make the slides a bit more sort of designed. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and in my original slide deck, this was just one giant picture. This is a band called Napalm Death. And they are, <laughs> they are a death metal band, and, and they do a lot of screaming. Uh, and um, they're, 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 their lead singer, so some, some of his songs just involve him just screaming for two minutes with, 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 with somebody else doing really loud feedback on a guitar. Um, and, uh, and originally, that was the whole slide, but I was told that broke the flow and it lost the dog theme. So... <laughs> So that's why it looks like that now. But the reason that's there is because when I first did this talk last year, um, the night before I did the talk, I went to see Napalm Death with my then 15-year-old son. Uh, or he might have been 14 at that point. Anyway, um, uh, and he, so he wanted to go and see Napalm Death, and he couldn't find anybody who wanted to go with him. And I'd heard of Napalm Death, and I knew that they you know, made music that doesn't always sound like music. And I thought... I'm not, I've never really particularly wanted to go and see Napalm Death, but the fact that my 14-year-old wants to, I'm, like, I'm quite intrigued. What is this experience going to be like? Why not? OK. So I did, and I loved it. I loved every minute of it. It was absolutely joyous. And I can't remember his name, but the, the, the lead singer, he, does, he gets on stage and he screams for two minutes, and then he goes really quiet and he talks about veganism and peace. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> And like, it's just, it was fantastic. I loved it so much. And anyway, the point is um, that different people enjoy different things. Be open to new experiences. You know, just, you know, let other people make suggestions and be open to something that you might not have thought was a good idea. So that's the, uh, um, the spiel for ThoughtWorks. We are hiring. Um, and, uh, and that was me. And I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well done. Love your shoes.